My name is Preben. I am at Go to Copenhagen and I managed to bring Fabio and Chris together here with me. Could you make a short introduction to yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Fabio. I, I think the best way to describe me is that I work with technology, but I don't work with technology because I actually work with people. Like my biggest passion is people behavior. And I started studying people behavior about 10 years ago. And I do have a computer science degree and I work with digital transformation, but human behavior and cultural change is what really inspires me. Hi, I'm Chris. I am a designer in some senses. I used to be an academic psychologist uh, and I worked a lot in cognitive neuroscience. So I'm super interested in both the brain slash mind and also what we do with our attention, how we spend our time and what that has to say about who we will become as people. That sounded very ponderous, I'm sorry. <laughs> but who will we become as people? What is technology doing to us? This is a really interesting question. Um, people ask if we're kind of evolving to be something else. My temptation is always to say no, because evolution takes many, many generations. So it's going to be a long, long time. Even if we have this technology for a long time, we won't necessarily see very much meaningful change. Like I don't imagine the brain is going to change very quickly. Uh, epigenetics is kind of interesting. It's not something I know very much about, but it's the idea that we might change a little bit already in response to our environment. But long-term evolutionary change, that's the long game. I doubt people will still have an iPhone by the time that is happening, or anything else. Is that true? Does evolution take that long? Uh, Don't we see changes from generation to generation right now? See, biologically, it takes a lot longer, as my understanding. Non-evolutionary biologists um, take this with a pinch of salt, but our behaviors are changing, but our society is changing, our expectations are changing, the available technology is changing. All of those can have an effect on our behavior. Nobody grows up in a vacuum, or they shouldn't. Yeah, in my opinion, I actually believe that what technology is doing to us, it is to some extent uh, making a lot of decisions on our behalf. So we make about 35,000 decisions a day, which is about one decision every two seconds. You probably just made a decision there. And then what technology is doing to us is that it's making a lot of those decisions for us, which can actually, to some extent, um, offload our brains when it makes good decisions for us, but it can actually clutter our brain when it actually takes off our attention because our attention is limited. So I see technology doing these two big things to us. And what's a lot of the, that's a lot of the things I talk about on, on the book, Digital Nudge, which is there is the technology that nudges for good which is the technology that makes good decisions for us. So to give a very simple example, uh, back in the days we would know the path to go somewhere like turn left and right and now the GPS, the, the, the maps applications, they do that for us. So we don't need to think about which way we are going because we offload our brain decisions to that technology. But at the same time, we have social media that sucks our attention and we spend hours and hours and hours on social media. And we don't even know what we are doing there sometimes because we spend hours and suddenly we're watching like videos of kitten and we don't even know how we ended up there. So that's how I like to see what technology is doing to us. Sometimes it sucks our attention. Sometimes it actually offloads our attention and it helps us make better decisions. But talking about the social media, I would argue that it actually loads us with even more decisions that we need to make rather than technique making decisions for us. I agree. I think the some of the things we do on social media, instead of helping us, so it all depends on our goals and our intentions. Sometimes when we go to social media, it's just really a way to offload some things that we are feeling inside of us. I really like uh, a book from a friend called Nireal, it's, it's called Indistractable. He says that distractions come from within. So instead of thinking that it is the phone that is distracting us, we are actually getting distract distracted from something that's coming from within. And then we go to kind of fix that feeling that we are feeling right now. And then we go to social media to feel something else. But I actually think that some applications and some technologies can help us and some can harm us. 
and that's the whole ethical discussion we have to we have to have about why we are building something and why we are using something and to have control over that technology. Well said. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Are you on Facebook? No. Why not? Uh, I never joined, but the reason for that was I didn't feel the need for it. So uh, back in the day, I was on Live Journal, if you remember what that was. Uh, it was a social network before Facebook. Uh, I worked pretty well. It was sociable. It was nice. I had a few people that I was I would talk to and, and who knew. I was mostly uh, it was mostly people I didn't know in real life, but that was okay. And then Facebook came along, and I thought, well, it's just another of the same. And then uh, it started to become very clear that Facebook had a very cavalier approach to security and privacy and they would turn everything upside down on users one day to the next and i thought i don't want to join this uh, this doesn't this isn't um compatible with my ethics i don't believe that they're doing good and much as i hate to say i told you so kind of looks like um i was maybe right about that and like every news story that comes out i'm just like oh why so yeah, um, long story short, not on Facebook. Very happy not to be on Facebook. Are you? I reduced my Facebook usage considerably. The thing is, I don't believe that we have to completely detox from technology and completely stop using it. What I usually recommend is to use it consciously. The thing is, if we have control over the time and the intentions we have on social media, and if we create mechanisms to actually help us with that, so if we say, okay, I'm only going to use this for, let's say, half an hour a day, uh, I think it can help us. So I've lived uh, away from my family for too long. I'm Brazilian and I've lived in Australia for eight years. And then, of course, like technology helped me a lot keep in touch with what was happening with family. And, and Facebook was definitely a way to keep track of that, of like, my nephews and my nieces who were being born and, and I was missing all that. So I think that technology can help us connect with people who are away from us, but sometimes it's actually harming us because it disconnects from people who are really next to each other. So we could be having breakfast in front of someone and talking to someone on the other side of the world instead of having that physical connection eye to eye with someone who's really next to us. So I believe in conscious usage as opposed to completely like detoxing and, and getting rid of it. That sounds like one for you. You're working with UX, designing user experience. So yeah. the need for understanding what it does to us and be, say, constructive about it. I guess that's very crucial to know the times you're living in. Yeah, I think that's really important. So what you were saying about we need to be conscious about how we use it. I think that's absolutely the key. I, it's not like I'm on Facebook because um, I don't want to keep in touch with people, but I choose other ways to do that that work for me. I was on Twitter uh, and I left uh, about a year and a half ago, I guess. And it was a, a very conscious decision to go, right, okay, enough of this. Let me see if I can make my relationships work with people who live far away, who live near me, using another medium because it was more important. Twitter was not the, not the important thing. The important thing was to keep in touch with people. And a consequence of that is that you lose a lot of weak ties. So you end up um, maybe not daily connected to as many people, but a nice flip side of that is that you end up with reinforcing your strong ties. So you end up spending more time with family, friends, um, more time thinking about family and friends and a little bit less time just kind of grasping around uh, at things um, which are moving and shiny. Uh, and as you say, that kind of unquiet inside, oh, I must do something with this. Uh, if there are fewer surfaces to just kind of spray that uh, disquiet, disquietitude, uh, if there are fewer spaces to just sort of uh, spread that feeling around, then um, uh, you have to think about, well, what is it that I want and who should I tell this to? And now I have this really, it's almost like I have this sort of media uh, center in my brain that is going, oh, I've had this thought. Is this a useful thought? How can I share this? Who would be the right person to share this with? Uh, whether it's my parents or, you know, my, my friends or my husband, uh, where is the right place for this thought rather than just everywhere? Let me just spray it all over every surface. And that seems interesting, maybe helpful. 
And uh, just one comment on that, I completely agree. Like it feels like some of the social media try to make the default broadcasting. But one thing I like on Instagram is that it created the concept of close friends. So if you do want to post something that only your close friends would be able to see it, then you can create that subset, which is I think what you're calling like the strong connections. And, and definitely we have to consciously think about who we are sharing what with as opposed to just broadcasting everything to everyone as if it was. <laughs> so, yeah, some things we should not be sharing things with everyone in the whole world that follows us, yeah. This conversation has pretty much turned into a talk about the dystopia we're living in. Uh, and technology certainly has ups and downs, but let's face it, we have possibilities that we never ever had before. That is amazing. One final question. If you could freeze time, looking back on your entire life, if you could freeze time at any point, where would that be? You're looking at me. I'll yeah, answer yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I would choose 1991. No, no, let me take that back. I think I would choose 1993. I was a student. I had access to the internet. It was great. It was pretty quiet. There was lots of interesting stuff. Everything was text-based pretty much until uh, we got Netscape Navigator, I guess, at the university. And it was just great. You could just explore all day long. You could talk to random people in a different country. It was pretty, pretty relaxed in a way. Uh, and I miss that. Everything seems very fast now uh, on the internet. Um, but a consequence of that, which I think is probably important to remember, is that uh, that internet excluded a lot of people. A lot of people who didn't have access to it, couldn't afford it, didn't have a computer, didn't even have electricity. Um, so my nice little internet of 1993 uh, is not real in the sense that it's uh, very exclusive and privileged. Uh, but I did enjoy it anyway. It's a hard question. I, To be honest, I don't think I would freeze. I'm a true believer of the flow of time and the concept of impermanence, which is like everything changes and it will keep changing. And I like change. So I think if I dreamt about freezing something, I would go against my passion for change and my true and, and genuine like understanding of the fact that things change. So just the word freeze just reminds me of the whole thing about like code freeze. Oh, we can't change that code because it's code freeze time now. Um, but I think there are elements of, of the past that we can remember and maybe get back to. And I think I would even go back like before my childhood. And I would say that one of the elements that we should go back to as humans is our connection with nature. I would say that we've locked ourselves into uh, like buildings and we are far from the nature. And I, I truly believe, and I've done experiments with myself when I go out for lunch and I look at like green and I go to a park and I look at trees and I come back to work after, after lunch and I feel better. And uh, Linda Rising is actually someone who talks a lot about this research that shows that when we connect with nature, that we release things in our bodies. Uh, neurochemicals that actually make us feel better. And in fact, people are more productive after lunch if they go out and they see nature. So I would say that's far back from my childhood, but I think we should reconnect more with nature. That's one of the things I would take that element of the past and bring to the present and maybe to the future. I think that's a wonderful statement to conclude this conversation. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.